Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Diversity Plus You in the Workplace alumni panel. We appreciate all of you joining us this afternoon for our final webinar for the Diversity Plus You Workplace Week. During today's webinar, we are pleased to present two current students moderating our panel of young alumni. Our first moderator is Gabrielle Odier. She's currently studying psychology in media and professional communications here at Pitt. Our second moderator is Tyree Kopp. He, is complete, he completed his undergraduate work here at Pitt and he is currently studying at Katz Business School. Welcome you guys. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Thank you Devin for introducing us. And again, we'd like to say um, welcome to all of you. And before we start, we would like to say thank you to all of our gracious panelists here. Um, at least if we don't mind, we can go down the list just have you guys introduce yourselves, um, talk a little bit about what you do and you know how you got here. Um, so Elise. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Elise Williams. I am a 09 grad of Pitt. I feel like an um, ancient dinosaur these days, um, but I'm an 09, I did our double degree program. So my degrees were in marketing and political science. I minored in Japanese. And then I did two certificates, one in East Asian studies one international marketing. So you can kind of tell that international was um, something that was very big for me in my education. Um, and then after graduating, I worked in corporate America for a couple of months, decided um, I did a study abroad in Japan when I was at Pitt. I decided I really wanted to go back to Asia, had the opportunity actually through career services on the job board to go to China and live and teach. Um, and so I did that for about three years and then I returned home. Um, worked for the Hershey Company and then decided to come back to Pitt um, and work in admissions to help students have a similar experience um, to myself because I had a great experience here. Yeah, so that's a little bit about me. How about you, Adebimbola? Uh, yeah, so I, I go by Ade, um, originally from DC. I don't know if you can see my, my flag up there. I uh, went to Pitt, graduated in 2016, uh, studied information science there. Uh, how did I get here? Well, uh, I've been playing soccer since age of three, um, and my brother he started computer science. So I figured once I once I knew that I wasn't going pro, I said I have to do something at the intersection of technology and sports. Um, so I channeled my efforts there, and first job out. Uh, sorry for my Slack messages, but uh, first job out was at ESPN. Uh, worked in the BI department. Um, did that for about two years, and decided I wanted to get I guess like a, a newer challenge. And I went to a startup where I work with a bunch of different leagues, teams, and agencies for all, all of their event management needs. Uh, so working on building products that help help with that. Uh, spent two years there, and then pandemic hit. So I figured it might be a good time to make a shift away from uh, live sporting sporting events. Um, made the move over to Disney, where I currently work as a product manager, uh, working on Disney Plus, Star Plus, um, Dream Apps. Yeah. And last but certainly not least, um, AC, if you don't mind, you know, introducing yourself. Awesome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alan Williams, but I also go by AC because I'm super chill. I use pronouns he, him, his, and I'm a more recent graduate of Pitt. I graduated in 2020, so I'm a COVID grad, and so I'm not too far removed. And so um, originally when I left the university, I went to the University of South Florida, for a very short stint. And now I work at the University at Buffalo as a program coordinator working in the Intercultural and Diversity Center. That's lovely. Thank you guys. Um, we're gonna go on and start with the questions. So my first question, and we'll start with you, Ade. Um, how did you begin to navigate the role you're in currently? Were there like any steps along the way that kind of helped you, especially from your undergrad journey up until now? Yeah, um, it was actually my internship after my sophomore year. So down in DC, like they have, um, I guess, summer youth employment program. I'm not sure if it's still around. But um, in, in the summer times, like they, they have a program where you can apply for different internships. And I was applying for this, like all types of technology internships. And the one that I got paired with was um, a mobile development startup down in DC. So um, I guess every, everything I was learning on the job was, you know, very beneficial to the point where um, I showed enough interest and they offered me a full-time opportunity. So I left Pitt for a year and a half to, to go work and uh, earn more skills. 
And every single application that I've put out since then, like all, all the questions really stem back to, to that experience. Uh, so I would say like that was probably like the, the, the first uh, stepping stone that, that really got. Amazing, started. yes. How about you, Elise? What was your experience like? And uh, how did you begin to navigate the role that you're in currently? Yeah, um, so when I came to Pitt originally, I wanted to go into international corporate law, which is not what I'm doing. So you can clearly see I went on a different path. It was actually um, the diversity, not only of, um, you know, racial um, and ethnic diversity, but diversity of class and income that really um, showed me that education in the country is not equal and or fair. And so that really be, kind of changed how I went about the rest of my time. Um, like I mentioned, I went and I taught in China um, for about three years. Um, so experiencing a different education system, the pros, the cons of that um, really sparked a joy for me in education and, and how important it is. Um, and so when I had a chance, I ran locally for my school board seat and I did win. Um, so I wanted to make a local impact in education in that way. And then I have the opportunity, like I said, to come into Pitt and still work in education. So um, the exposure that I had just to different people and different life experiences really um, set me on a different path than I initially thought I was going to be on. Um, but one that has been very, very rewarding because education is always something that no one can take from you. Um, and so it's really important for me to try to get people, regardless of income, race, ethnicity, religion, um, the best education that can be afforded to them. That's lovely. It's, it just goes to show how, you know, you can start on one path and really open your eyes when you get to school. What about you, AC? How is your journey? How are you navigating the role that you're in? And kind of what are some tips on, along the way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to be very candid. My journey um, had a couple of twists and turns. As I mentioned, I uh, went to the University of South Florida. That was what I considered to be a dream school. And it just did not pan out the way that I um, had imagined it to. So I was reminded of some of these keys to successes and some of the things I needed to, to thrive in an environment um, after that. And so um, I think one of the first things that I did was really talk to myself and kind of understand what it was that I wanted, what type of environment that I needed to be successful and thrive in, and um, what were some of those non-negotiables for myself. And so um, I was very transparent through the interview process, but then just um, even through external networks in the areas that I had planned to move about my career aspirations and my educational trajectory. And so like, as I started to search, I knew I wanted to get a PhD at some point. And so I wasn't going to take a position where there was not consideration or leverage to do so. Um, I also um, knew socially in order for me to thrive in my work environment, I needed to be around people that kind of look like me and understand, um, you know, different experiences that I may have been connected to. And so also being so far away from my family, I like one of my non-negotiables, non which is kind of silly, was like I needed to be near international airport and there needed to be an alumni chapter of my fraternity, right? And so simple things like that helped me um, think about what I needed to do to be successful in my role and find a place um, where I can do that. And I'm happy to say, I feel like that. Um, I'm thriving here at the University of Buffalo. We love to hear that. Thank you guys. And um, for the attendees, I just wanted to uh, mention that, you know, if you guys at any point have any questions that you would like to pose to our panelists here, please feel free to use the, the chat, the question and answer chat, um, and we'll be more than happy to ask those questions to our panelists. So moving on, moving on to the next question here, um, we just want to, you know, and AC, I'll, because you just been speaking, I'll direct this question to you. Um, specifically at the University of Pittsburgh, you know, what kind of clubs, mentors, leadership roles um, really helped you to develop the skills that you need to succeed? You know, build that criteria that you needed um, in your current role and in your future career. Absolutely. 
so yeah, so mine is kind of split. So uh, when I attended the university, I was um, seeking a master's of higher education administration. So I was in graduate school for two years. And so I would definitely say the school of education help uh, transform my thinking, right, my experiences, but then also um, it kind of helped shape my um, awareness of what I bring into spaces, right? Because I think being very candid as a black man, um, for the first time making money, for the first time traveling, seeing new experiences, mm -hmm. I was with whatever was in front of me, right? So I was just excited to be a part of so many opportunities. And so that helped me be very intentional about that, but to also seek spaces that were um, equity-minded and all that jazz. And so I think the other side of things was like Pitt Student Affairs. And so during my time at the university, I worked um, underneath Dean Bonner, but day-to-day -day, uh, in the Cross-Cultural Leadership Development Office. And so that CCLD really helped prepare me for a space and a place to where I could grow and develop as a um, student affairs practitioner and understand the dynamics of what it means to go through a university, right? Because like when I thought about it from a student perspective, I'm like, yeah, that was trauma. <laughs> but as an employee, it helped shift my thinking. It helped me navigate and negotiate different things that, you know, is important to being successful. And so last but not least, um, in, in that role, I worked with the Black Men's Collective and kind of did some of the starting up and like the reinvigoration of that organization. And so I think being able to connect and just have conversations with other Black men about their trajectory, some of their passions, really helped me develop my own awareness around, okay, here's what you need to be advocating for at the university level. So it helped me see things from a multi-layer lens. Definitely, definitely. Elise, how about you? You know, what experiences, whether leadership roles, uh, programs, mentors, mentees, um, kind of shaped your, your skills in your current role? Um, I was very busy, as you could tell, maybe by all the things I, I mentioned I was studying. Um, so my academic schedule was pretty tight. I also had like three jobs because like AC in full transparency, you know, I had to hustle, um, you know, to pay for pit too. Um, so I wasn't able to be in, as, um, in a lot of clubs and things like that. But something that really helped me was my, you know, my building in the business school, um, really teaching us how to walk into those um, interviews and those career fairs and really make the most of them. But I would say outside of that, um, my work study job, um, I'm still close friends with my boss to this day. I um, mean, she was she was instrumental in me getting this role um, that I'm, I'm having now here at Pitt. Um, but I would say another thing, and unfortunately it no longer exists, it is my life's mission to bring it back to the university. Um, it was a program called Focus and it was for students of color. And through that you were provided with an upperclassman mentor, um, there was community, that was, that was the biggest thing. It, it built community among the people of color at the university. And that really did shape my time at the university. Um, and I can see how instrumental in hindsight that was to my experience, both while at Pitt and after. Um, so I would say those are the things while I was at Pitt that helped shape me and get me to where I am now. And last but certainly not least, uh, Ademi uh, if you don't mind, just, you know, speaking on your, some of your experiences at Pitt, you know, what you were involved in that kind of shaped your, your current skills and your role. Yeah, so for me, uh, a lot of my time was spent like in or around like the soccer facilities. So I didn't have as much time to, I guess, par partake in yeah. uh, different organizations and use my time to do other things I would like to do. Um, but two, two groups that, I was happy to find, quite frankly, was uh, ASO and VAS. Because mm -hmm. uh, like myself, I'm Nigerian American. So my dad's Nigerian, my mom's from New York. So being able to, to find those two groups that sort of fuse, fuses those two, uh, two things together. Um, in addition to like what I do, um, like I guess outside of the classroom in athletics was like a nice safe space because we all know like Pittsburgh may not be the most diverse place <laughs> to be around. Yeah. Um, so to be able to, to find people like me, uh, it was definitely helpful um and it's actually pretty similar to what i do right now where uh most of the time like working in technology 
at least for me, like I'm one of the youngest or the blackest, if not both. Uh, so to be able to find different employee resource groups that are similar to uh, ASO and BAS um, is, is, is very helpful. Wow, such great answers. Thank you guys. Um, first and foremost, I just need to shout out Ade, my fellow Nigerian American, because that's what we have to do. <laughs> no, never carry yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> You know, then I just wanted to also uh, touch on Elisa's point about um, kind of that focus group. I mean, I think that one of the biggest things for us as Black students is that community. So I, I would love to see that get started again myself. Um, my closest friends came from a program like that at Pitt, so that's lovely. So next, we're going to just talk about like one of the most stressful processes for students, but I feel like specifically Black students at school, which is the job search. I mean, I would like to kind of start with you, Ade, first and foremost, because you had a really cool job, you know, coming off of college. We all really want to enter fields that are just interesting and exciting. What was your job search like? And, you know, how did you end up getting to ESPN? What are some steps that you took out to kind of make yourself stand out? Yeah, my job search is actually pretty rough. Um, mm. Like very, very rough to be completely honest. So um, my last semester, so I was supposed to graduate in, in December, but again, because of like athletics uh, and practice schedules, one of the classes that I had in the evening wasn't really going to as much because of travel schedules. Therefore, my grade reflected that. Uh, so I was back at Pitt for another semester. Um, so like that last semester in limbo, um, like I was just taking one class and applying to jobs like the whole time. And during that time, as you, probably know that's when people started to get their their offer letters left and right like hey I got my offer letter meanwhile I'm just like all right you know I'm back on campus for this one class I can't get no job <laughs> can't get no interview can't get nobody to, to call me back um so one day like for real I got lucky like because of that experience that I had like after my sophomore year like that kind of catapult catapulted me and like and uh had me stand out um but I've just made a list of all the companies I would like to, to work for and started to show how my skills can actually uh, relate to those, to those positions. Uh, like hence ESPN, like I made a list of all the sports <laughs> companies that I could that overlaps with technology and just went down the list and, and show like how I can actually be of value to the team. Um, and a lot of that spurred from like seeing a lot of my friends get those offer letters, uh, especially from like the bigger companies. I'm like, all right, clearly people work there, so it's, it's possible. So that kind of helped me keep, keep the faith as well. Yeah, that's something definitely I think we all needed to hear. Alan, I want to talk to you about your experience with kind of adversity in college and how that played during the uh, job search. What was that process like for you and how did you make yourself stand out? Yeah, um, so I think before I started to search for like my career, I was very intentional about like trying to create a network because I knew I really rely heavily on the people around me to give me an accurate reflection of like what it is I'm going to get myself into because I'm like one of those people I, I'll get like I'll find myself in the situation and I'm like wait <laughs> and right and I, I want to advocate and I want to change things and so sometimes that is beyond my control and so I always look for folks um, and to learn about their experience their journey to help shape me and, and kind of provide me insight. Um, and so when it came to job searching, it, was, it, it wasn't it was as challenging, uh, thankfully. I think what was challenging was finding the right job for me since I you know, had some, some changes here and there. Um, but doing it during COVID definitely was not ideal. And so mm -hmm. a lot of Zoom fatigue, trying to finish classes with a very quick transition um, was really challenging. But then I think also was there was this aware like lack of awareness or agency in my search so sometimes I would think to myself like oh this job asking for me to do an interview for eight hours literally like I had one job actually do an interview for eight hours but the salary was just like disrespectful right and so I'm thinking <laughs> about am I at a position to where I can <laughs> even advocate or like say like hey you know I just I think I should pay for the interview <laughs> no no but in all seriousness um like that was a really hard balance in line to navigate especially when it came to some of those um things that we'll kind of scope out or behind the 
closed door conversations that we would have in a typical or traditional interview, some of those things were limited. And so I didn't know, okay, well, what's an appropriate balance for having a conversation over email, right? And definitely with, um, with um, over the phone, right? Because you want to stay professional. And so some of those things was really hard to navigate. Um, but overall, I, I always jokingly say like finding a job is like dating, right? And so you got to move with confidence, utilize your networks to find the right person or situation. But then above all is really the resilience to continue to navigate through and um, just knowing what you want, right? Knowing what you want mm -hmm. and then being clear about what, what you will sacrifice on. That's some great advice for students. Thank you, AC. So Elise, how was your experience with the job search? And particularly, like, what made you actually want to come back to Pitt? Yeah, so um, I, like I mentioned before, I graduated in 09. So my advice to any 2020 or 2021 grads is find yourself an 09 grad because we know exactly what you're going through um, because we lived it. And, and I'll be honest with you, we're still living it, right? Like we're back in another one. Um, so we're being hit again. So that's really where the side hustle started. Right, it was with the 09 grads because we had to survive. I had a job. Um, I got flown out to Atlanta, wined and dined, um, secured that job. It was with a major retailer here in the United States. Then Christmas time came, they didn't do well. I stopped hearing from them. Um, and so I finally heard back in February, it was essentially told that we had to let go of your position because we have to save people that are here. Right, so you know the cycle of jobs when you're a senior February is game over right you have you have your job in the fall um so I used the careers the career services um the spring fair I used the website I was on it religiously all day every day um because I knew that out of all the job boards these people were looking for people um that were coming out of college right so it was a very specific type of market I had less competition than if I went to like an Indeed or something like that and um, I didn't get a job until I think I started in September. Um, so that whole time uh, was very stressful because Sally was coming and she wanted her money and she wanted it fast. <laughs> so I had to figure something out. And, um, and so that, that really has shaped um, everything that I have done. Um, I always have a side hustle going on. Um, like I mentioned, you know, I ran for office. I'm always, like AC mentioned, you, your network is everything. Every job that I have ever gotten was due to my network, whether that be here at Pitt or externally. Um, you really have to work that network because now uh, it was starting to happen when I graduated, but now it's full fledged with the whole computer thing. Um, it, you may be the best candidate, you will never get a chance because the computer will weed you out. It really comes down to your network. Um, so. I'm not the most social person. I like to stay in my house, but you have to kind of move past that um, because that networking, like I said, it, it is so crucial to your success. But also I advise you to have a side hustle. Maybe you don't do it full fledged, but it really gives you agency to know that if something goes south, I have some other form of income that I can you know, have to survive and to hold me over because those gaps in your, in your work experience really matter. Um, and companies really do look at them. So at least by having that, that's something you can maintain on your resume to keep your um, resume at least consistent um, and, and avoid that gap. Um, so that would that would be my advice from, from my own personal experience. Um, yeah, find yourself an 09 grad. We, will, we have a lot of advice for you. Yes, I really appreciate you speaking on that particular topic because I know myself and my grade, it, it's, it was terrifying to watch the people who graduated last year just go into this world of unknown. So I definitely you know, can relate and appreciate you for speaking on these things. For sure, for sure. I mean, I promise you just as a undergrad 2020 graduate, coming out into the world during COVID was definitely a scary thought. Like you said, you know, it's always good to have a side hustle. Luckily grad school is my, you know, side hustle quote unquote but even now it's still it's still definitely scary I, I think we can all students and graduates can all relate to that uh now like you guys are in your positions you guys are have found your jobs you know that you know you feel comfortable in so I guess our question our next question would be in your opinion and from you guys' personal experience 
um, would you say that your organization promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion? You know, that's why we're here to talk about being a minority, being an underrepresented uh, person within these organizations. So do you think that your organization promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion? And I will hand this question right back off to Ill. Yeah, um, so in my office, I work, you know, like I said, in the, in the admissions office, um, I will say that it has to be intentional. And my director, who was a black woman, um, made it her intention to diversify, um, at least with, when, with what she had scope of, which was her team. Um, and so for me, this is the first time in my 10 plus years of working that I can show up to work my whole self every single day. Um, I don't have to, you know, feel like I have to put down all the things that are going on in my personal life or through society that are affecting me when I step into work. Um, I know that she has personally reached out to me, you know, when George Floyd died and Ahmaud Arbery and unfortunately all the countless others, you know, and things that are going on. She, she personally reaches out to me and says like, hey, I'm just checking in on you. You need to take a mental health day. I, I want you to know that I support you. And so I feel very supported in my office, but it also, I know from speaking with her, it has to be a thing of intention. Um, and I am encouraged about the fact that it is being spoken about to the degree that it is being spoken about now, that if nothing more, <laughs> it's being done out of necessity for business um, with residual effects, hopefully, than anything else. And I think that as a person of color, in my 10 years of working at least, this is the most I've ever felt seen. Um, we do have our own DEI committee in our office that us as staff wanted to form um, and went to leadership and asked for it to be uh, formed. And um, we had a part in going test optional. Um, I helped draft the proposal for us to go test optional for this year. Um, and that was later enacted, right? So. Um, no matter what workspace that you're in, it is important for you to show up as yourself because you have to remember, and they also have to remember that they hired you. They didn't hire parts of you, they hired you. And all of the life experience that you have is reflected in the skills and talents that you were able to do for that employer, right? Um, and so I would just encourage you to never feel small, take up space. Um, and don't feel like you have to minimize who you are because they hired you because you had abilities that they wanted in the organization. Um, and you just have to, you have to remember that. Um, and yeah, and take up space. For sure. I think, I think we can all agree at some point, you know, just to, just to feel safe and comfortable within the workplace, we, we oftentimes diminish ourselves, which is very, very unfortunate completely agree with you. We should, they hired us. We should be able to bring our whole selves to work. Um, now, Ade, same question, um, you know, do you think that your organization, you know, such a big organization like that, do you think that they promote diversity, equity, and inclusion? So because they are a big organization, I think they, they promote it as more so like lip service, where it's like, okay, like, yeah, we're, we're, we're on the trend. Like we're, we're trying to do what we can to promote it. And then they, they show you the numbers and it's like, well, you've been talking about it, but things look a little bit different, especially like when you dive deeper into the numbers and like where they're spread out. Like, I, I can't tell you how many times like I, I've, I've walked into so many different rooms and I'm again, the youngest and the blackest. <laughs> it's just like, how does this correlate to, to what you're promoting? Like, I, I, I would expect to see like a few more numbers in here by now. Um, but again, like, like, thankfully, like that's why I look, uh, I guess, outside of my uh, organization to find um, to find groups where you can get that support um, where your organization may lack. Um, but I, I definitely think there there is a lot more room to grow, especially in technology, when it comes to promoting diversity and inclusion, because this is not not a thing. And I, I think it starts even before people get to uh, to the organizations, like started university, started high school, started elementary school, because I mean, it's, it's one thing to continue to talk about it, but like you have to put things in place to actually get people there and increase, the, it's not even just like increasing the numbers, but like 
being authentic about it. Like if you really want to do it, you can make something happen instead of just talking to me about it. For sure, for sure. I think we can all we can all agree that, you know, being the one standing out in a room, you know, filled with people who don't look anything like you, definitely not what we want to we don't want to feel uncomfortable in those settings. So definitely some room to go there. Um AC, same question posed to you. Yeah, first I gotta cut the recorder. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, um, so again, I work for university and I think that we all can admit in some ways universities are inherently oppressive and exclusionary. And so I'm gonna say yes, my specific office and my direct supervisor promote um diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, I'm not as quick to say that that's the case for the entire um, campus community and outside of our space. Again, it happens in pockets, but uh, to um, some of the other points mentioned, it's like, where is the authenticity and how can we help continue to spread this all throughout our institution? And so um, I am excited that, you know, some of the recent events in the past like 18 months have really force um, institutions and corporations to shift their thinking and to invite the conversation in and to say like, you know, even with the pandemic, I think a big question with how we move forward is well, what have we always done? Why do we do this? And should we continue to do this moving forward? And so it helps us rethink all of our practices. And so I am excited that these trends will continue to grow. For sure, for sure. I, I guess uh, mostly for Ada and AC here. Um, at what point, well, at least as well, um, at what point do you think that students should, you know, balance your career goals versus, you know, does this company feel, do I feel comfortable within this company? What AC, you mentioned it earlier about, you know, your requirements in order to you know accept an offer from a company so at what point at what point and how do you find yourself balancing between you know your career goals and your requirements for comfort levels because sometimes you know being the the active person trying to encourage diversity and inclusion sometimes feel like a second job so at what point do you think that students and current professionals should strike that balance and anybody can go ahead and take their question. Yeah, I think that's such a good question that I've had to ask myself so many times. I think I've had to ask myself that as a student wanting to transfer, as a young professional wondering, am I being taken advantage of? And now as a professional. And so um, through those different stages, I have been led to this point. And I, tr I believe this wholeheartedly. And I ask myself this all the time. I ask my friends. And it's really, is the risk greater than the reward, right? And so it's simple, but it really is important. And I think that little significance is a game changer for whether or not that's a space for you to grow. Because, you know, now having the opportunity to serve as a supervisor, I understand that, uh, the dynamics between, sometimes there are things that we want to do and there's, you know, experiences that we would like, which is like this perfect wish list. And, and there are things that we should do that will help grow us and stretch us to become better, um, to think broader. And so we really have to be strategic in those ways. And so asking yourself, what does this require of me? But also like, what am I getting out of this? Um, that's my number one question. And I have to continually ask myself that. For sure. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you do have to really ask yourself, you know, at the end of the day, what's in it for you, right? I know that sounds selfish, but you, you know, this is your your health, your mental health, your well being that you have to, you know, you have to protect. Um, so any place that you feel that when you show up, it is detrimental to your being, I would definitely encourage you not to stay there. No check is worth it. Um, the money will come. You know, it's it's not worth staying there because that money is not going to make you whole. Um, but also it is almost, um, it's almost the thing that will inevitably, unfortunately happen, right? As a person of color, usually very few people of color, like I said, in 10 years, it's the first role that I've ever had where I was not by myself. Um, and so people will always look to you, right? And so I think it's also important to establish boundaries. 
um, what you will, it will not, you know, do as far as that, that extra labor, that tax on being a person of color. Um, oh, we want to do diversity, equity, inclusion. Oh, you're the only one. Let me turn to you and let me tell you that, like, we want you to be on this committee. We want you to be on this team. And it has taken me some time to protect my own self and say, no, you can go ahead and either hire out for that or you can find somebody else in the office because just because the color of my skin does not also mean I'm the only person who cares about this. There's white people that care about this too. And there might be somebody who's really excited to do this extra work that is not me, right? Um, so I think that you really have to be honest with yourself and, and don't be afraid to say no to things that are beyond what you were hired for, um, you know, because if, especially if you're not going to be compensated for it, if it's not within the scope of your role, um, and it's far outside of your role, I think that's when you start having conversations, you know, is this coming with compensation? If not, then, you know, at this time, I would like to focus on the things that I was hired to do. And leave it at that. Definitely. I know sometimes, sometimes, you know, we fall into those roles, you know, taking on the diversity action plan, you know, a lot of times we just end up because we're, you know, the only ones there. So you're definitely right with, you know, making the conscious decision whether or not to accept that new role or not to accept it. Um, same question for you, Adam. Like they, they took all the good points. Um, the money is not, it's not worth it. Um, like if you have to take on a second job, that's pretty much mentally taxing because you live these things on, on a daily basis, probably not worth it. Um, but I, I will say like, the challenge starting out um, was something that I had to overcome as well. Whereas like, you know, sometimes we, we don't come from the silver spoon. Like we don't really have the bread coming out of school. So like, it's a little bit more of a pressure to make sure that you do have a job so you can start to take care of the bills. And sometimes like your family as well, if, if needed. Um, so you may end up overlooking some of these things or some of these, some, some of these jobs where you may have to deal with being the only one or taking on a few of those things. But after like that, that initial, that initial point that you can be a little bit more selective, but I mean, that, that initial pressure leaving, uh, like to get into your, your first role is definitely there for sure. So don't, don't feel alone in, in that. We appreciate you guys for answering all of those questions. Um, I actually have a question specifically for Ade, which is about your, um, ERG group that you spoke about previously. Can you just tell the audience what, you know, it is and how can people find out, you know, about it in the companies that they work at? Yeah, um, so I actually found out about it when I got to ESPN, uh, ERG's Employee Research Group. I know they have different acronyms at, at different uh, companies for it, but the way I found out about it was uh, another older, older Black man, like he, he saw me walk in and get, get him out breakfast like I normally do. He's like, hey, you're a new face. Like I haven't seen you before. I mean, it's obvious because you know <laughs> you kind of stick out when when you're amongst uh, that that many others. Um, so then he starts to give me like the rundown of the people that I need to meet um, around campus or like ESPN's campus, um, and then different organizations I can be a part of. Um, and he told me uh, about the the ERG at ESPN at the time. Um, and another way that, that you can find it, it should be on, on the websites as well. Like I, I know like now on certain career career uh, sites for these companies, like they'll list out the different types of programs and things that, that, that they champion. Uh, some of those things may be employee resource groups. So you could read up and see if they have it. Um, and then you can also do like a search on LinkedIn as well. Sometimes they have uh, LinkedIn pages or they have people who are uh, in these groups and like they may list it on their profile. So that's another way you can to find it, ask them about it, like ask how real it is. Is it just, you know, to tick a box because other companies have it? Um, or like, do they actually uh, support and, and mean what it is that they have as a group? Um, but yeah, that, that's how I found out about it. Thank you. Now we'll go to Elise. Um, I was just wondering about, you spoke earlier about the role of mentors in your journey. Can you elaborate on, you know, what makes a reliable mentor and how, specifically your mentors kind of guided you through this process? Um, I think for me, I, I've, I've never had, I have a mentee now, um, but I've never had an official person that I called my mentor um, in that formal capacity. And I think that that's also important that 
um, it's a relationship, right? Uh, a mentor and a mentee is it's about a relationship. And sometimes it doesn't have to have a formal title for it to be that. Um, so yeah. for me, a lot of that was informal um, and just people who, who were willing to invest in me, right? Um, at my previous role at the Hershey company, um, I went to a conference that they had within the organization and kind of like a, a day, someone reached out to me and said, hey, look, because I was one of very few, um, and say, hey, you know, like, let's talk, right? And we ended up having a similar journey and he just texted me happy Easter. We still talk to this day and I haven't been, you know, been there to this day and I know I can rely on him, right? So I, I think it's important for you not to be afraid to share your story with folks um, because people are, are usually happy if they see that you have drive and you have things that you want to do um, and they have the, a way and a means to connect you with the right people, they're usually more than happy to do that. So you just can't be afraid to tell your story and to get out there and make yourself vulnerable, right? Introduce yourself, um, like you said, to, to people. Um, kind of back to the resource group, we have one at, here at Pitt large, largely, but in my office, after everything that was going on, I wanted a safe space for Black people in my office. Um, and so I formed a, an impromptu resource group in my office and we meet once a month for an hour in the morning just to say like, how are you? They're like, Let's check in um, because we have unique um, experiences and needs, right? Um, that we can absolutely you know count on each other so I also wanted to say for those of you who are at smaller organizations if you don't have a company-wide resource group that shouldn't prevent you from taking initiative whether it be go out on lunch or hey we're going to do this one hour zoom meeting for starting that for yourself because that community is very important can lead to mentors can lead to networking as well um, but having a community is really important thank you Alan, how about you? Any mentors in your life and what did they look like? How did yeah, they help you along the way? Absolutely. Um, so I definitely have a couple of mentors, um, but I think what's important that I wanted to mention really quick, because this changed my life <laughs> um, with who I considered a mentor and how I separated them, was really um, designating the difference between a mentor a sponsor and advisor exactly i'm really glad you're about to touch on this yeah, yeah and you and you need all three right and so my mentor was someone who understands all aspects of my life who may be able to say here's how my family dynamics is impacting my academics is impacting my commitment to work if there was boundaries obviously because um that's important but there were more loose boundaries because i was able to be transparent um and so i would say based off of that mentorship should not be comfortable right it's not a hey man hallelujah club i need a reference and let's go on to the next stage it's someone who's going to push you and challenge you and also gives you homework and so um, one of my mentors from undergrad who is a, a director um and currently a co-interim dean of students is has supported me through my journey um through all the struggles um a sponsor is somebody who's willing to pay for things on your behalf and to, you know, provide financial support in some aspects. And it could just be other types of resources. Here's a book, here's this, here's that. And then last but not least, I would consider uh, an additional person, which is an advisor. And some, and that's usually someone who's like within the field that I wanna be in, who I can um, seek counsel from, but there is not as much of an investment as a mentor, um, if that makes sense. And so that's kind of how I separated. My mentors have had my back and have pushed me. And sometimes when they call or, you know, I have a meeting, I'm like, oh man, I wish I could just ah, like, like leave this, right? Because it, it challenged you. I think your mentors should um, be there to support, but also challenge you, definitely. I completely relate. Finally, Ade, can you speak on your experiences with mentors, if you had any, and what that relationship was like? Yeah, um, I have quite a few, actually. Um, Lovely. For, for different reasons, too. Um, like, I have mentors in, I guess, the different aspects of my life. Um, so whether it be, like, my current role, product management, whether it be in soccer, or just, like, in life in general, I like all, they all serve different purposes, and all very necessary as well um and i also see carol's question as well of like um like outside groups that i found uh so one group that i found was uh black product managers um and that helped me find like my product management uh mentor last year um like i pretty much wanted to level up more more in the field and 
that's probably been like the best mentorship that I've formed so far. Uh, one, like um, it, it's turned into more of like a professional and personal mentorship, uh, almost like a close to a big brother kind of thing, really, because someone who's young in the field, um, like in the product management field, the same field I'm in, um, like understand what I'm going through, like on a, on a personal level and how they may impact my, my work um, as a whole. Um, it's definitely been, you know, next to none, especially with, with, with this past year with all the, that, we, that we've gone through. Uh, so being able to speak to him on a, on a more candid level um, while still keeping like the professional aspect has definitely been. Well, uh, thank you for speaking on that particular uh, point because I think within this last year, all of us who are black or of color, we realized how much we bottled things up and we weren't necessarily even communicating amongst right. ourselves about things that were triggering us. So it's it's cool to see that space opened up, especially between you and mentors. Definitely, definitely agree. You know, having mentors, advisors, everything like that definitely makes you feel like, you know, you're not alone in these spaces. And these are people who have gone through what you've been through and can help you navigate some of the pitfalls, you know. Definitely, definitely um, important to have those. Uh, just going back to um, speaking about the diversity and inclusion within you guys' organizations, you know, oftentimes, you know, I they said it, you know, a lot of times it's just to, just for show. Um, what do you guys think is the most effective way that diversity, equity, and inclusion is portrayed within your organizations, you know, beyond just the superficial, um, here's a newsletter, here's, you know, we're here in case you need it. Um, what do you guys think are the most effective ways that organizations have showcased that they truly promote DE and I? Uh, I can pose that question to Elise. Um, I think, you know, for me, a lot of it has to do with hiring, right? Um, I, every time I'm offered a chance to be on a hiring committee, I've made sure I take that chance because to me that sets the tone, right? If the person is not able to speak to what the university in my case is saying is important, um, then they are not maybe a good fit because that's one of the core principles, right, of, of the organization. So I would, and I was gonna say this earlier, I really encourage you to, it's not fun, it's not, you know, sexy, but I really encourage you to look at your organization's mission statement, um, what they say their values are, because I oftentimes reference that, you know, like XYZ is happening, um, your position on it, can you tell me how that goes back to the strategic plan number four with promoting diversity, right? Um, and, and you have to really, know what you're talking about in order to, to, to force that sometimes to make it go beyond just the lip service. Um, but I think uh, it starts with hiring. So if you have the chance to um, be in those spaces and be in those rooms and ask those questions, don't be afraid to ask those questions because um, you would be surprised <laughs> of the answers that you will get, especially around DEI. Um, but I would also say, like I said, go back to the, that mission statement. Everybody has it in their mission statement, especially these days, um, but it doesn't reflect in their work, right? And so um, if, if you're not seeing that reflected, have a, a meeting with your leadership, like, hey, you know, I know that this is something that's important. I would like to help support that. Can you help me understand what we're doing regarding X, Y, and Z. And there might be things going on in the background you have no idea about, right? Especially depending on your position. Um, and so that might provide some insight where you think, oh, nothing is going on. And in fact, there really are things going on so that you have a better understanding um, of your organization. And kind of like we talked about before, if you're not feeling supported and that's something that's really important to you, then um, maybe that might not be the right place for you. And it might be a signal that you might want to go somewhere else. For sure, for sure. Because I know personally, you know, I can probably count on one hand the number of people within admissions and uh, recruit recruitment that, you know, look anything similar to me. So that's definitely, definitely a good point. Um, Ade, same question. Yeah. Um, if I were to break it down, I'll probably say recruitment, hiring, elevation, 
and retention. Um, one, like, where are you looking for this talent? <laughs> you can't tell me we're not talented. Like, we're here. We're around. We can, we can do the things that you, that you need us to do. Uh, so hire us and get us in the door. Um, and then while we're there, like, give us pathways to, you know, succeed. Support us where, where we need it. Um, don't just make us, like, another number in, in the room. Um, like, especially, like, when, once you get in the door, like, something I'm going through right now, I'm in the door. Cool. I'm at Disney. Also cool. I look up. Nobody looks like me. So, like, that's not really... That doesn't make me feel the, the greatest inside because like where, where else can I go? Like I don't see anybody up there that can like relate to even ask the question of like how'd you get up there? Um so yeah, like providing uh opportunities for elevation. Um and then once I'm once I'm there, like how can you keep me there? Um can you continue to support me? Um can you hire more people like me that would make me want to stay? Uh, can you create more opportunities like even before you get to the hiring process uh, to get more people in, in the door? Um, so yeah, if I were to break it down, I'll probably put it put it that way. Definitely, definitely made some valid points there. You know, it's it's hiring, it's recruitment, it's also keeping you know those individuals there and happy and you know room for progress because you know we're all working with the end goal of learning more, doing more, advancing in our different careers. Um, AC, same question for you. Yeah. <clears throat> I just have things that are pretty similar to what was already said. I think the first thing I was thinking about was that um, money, right? So diversity without funding is fraud. It's a fraudulent claim, you know, because you'll see that sometimes. But then when it comes to time to discuss the resources available, they're limited. Um, and so as Elise already mentioned, when it comes to hiring, but also professional development opportunities, which connects to what Ade mentioned about developing and help them provide additional opportunities. And then last but not least, I would just say integrity. I think that's a very important and it goes a long way. And it's how are you supervising, supporting, and listening to the folks who you're working with? Um, and are you speaking to them or are you speaking for them? Um, so that's pretty important. Thank you all for those wonderful tips about you know increasing diversity, equity, inclusion. My final question for you all has to do with kind of the changing world. So after George Floyd passed, I think every business made a commitment to kind of do something in some spectrum. To me as a young black woman, it says maybe there's more opportunities available to me at this point. As a young person going into the workforce, what does that mean as far as applications? Because there's a, you know, all these jobs kind of opening up that we've never heard of. And, you know, how can we present ourselves skill-wise? So if you guys could just take a minute to be really, you know, truthful and raw and kind of explain what, like what we're headed into. Um, we'll start with you, Ade. Well, um, like having been in some of, the, some of these meetings now, um, especially, you know, after after they made their claims of like what they want to do um, in response to you know what what we've been seeing for the, for the past year or actually all of our lives, really, but what's now come to the forefront uh, in, in the past year, um, it definitely sounds like the the future is promising in terms of like how they're going to think about talent, um, like for us uh, or like how to think about us like as talent um, and the different opportunities that, that are there. Um, like how, how to get there i mean it's, it's tough to say because like they're looking but I'm not, I'm not so sure like where to put yourself um to i guess be seen um besides just like networking talking to people uh getting the application in front of as many people as possible kind of like the, the cliche things um but it, it it does sound like there there's a push uh to get more of us in the door for sure thank you same question to you elise Kind of going off of what a day is talking about, so that was more like the intro, like what if what if you get in there, right? Um, if we're being raw and we're being honest in this conversation, you might have been a token hire, right? Um, and and knowing that, um, you know, you can position yourself however you want to, right? Um, really learn how the organization is working and use it to your benefit, right? Um, because especially if you're the only one. There are a lot of eyes on these, especially larger companies, about their makeups, right? Um, and so you might be able to 
get away with a little bit more candor <laughs> than you could um, in the past because they need you a little bit more than they might have needed you a couple of years ago, right? Um, just even outside of Pitt, I got asked to be on a board recently um, because I was very candid with them. I said, look, you're, you're trying to go into a community that is a largely Black and not one of the people on your board is Black. How can you serve, how can you accurately serve that? Not only that, but none of you are actually from that community. Like, how are you really thinking you're going to serve that community, right? And I was very honest with them. Um, and then they offered me a board position. <laughs> so, you know, I would just say, don't don't be afraid to, to, to really have, obviously, always, you know, always be professional. But I think people are in a space right now that I've never seen person in my life before, where they're willing to have a, a, some of these tougher conversations. Of course, you can, you know, you got to test the water to see how genuine it is. And if you're, you know, kind of walking into a trap. Um, but I would say, you know, test the waters on, on those conversations because it may open up doors for you that you didn't know could be open um, just because you were you were candid, right? They do need you. They need us right now. Um, and that's a strong position to be in, to walk in it. Yes, I definitely appreciate that point. I think they've needed us always, but it's kind of like, you know, we've been so ignored and I think the product will now look better having us included a part of the process. AC, what do you think? Um, I think what the folks before me have added is pretty solid, right? It's very promising. I think the only additional thing I would have to contribute and not to be the jaded one is that there is a learning curve or, there, or you should just kind of curb your expectations because if you're working with a company that is not used to working with diverse folks, right? There is some level of kind of just growth or, or transition that you may experience, right? Whether that's defensiveness or reluctance or just um, whatever that may be. And that can be harmless and it could be like intentional reluctance, right? Um, and so I think navigating that is really gonna be important so that your confidence remains intact and that you are aware of your um, abilities to, to do your job. And so I just would encourage um, and add on to what my other peers have, have added, just continue to push folks to reimagine the possibilities and ask a lot of questions. Yes, thank you so much. I think we needed to hear some of the good along with the bad, just to walk in there with our eyes wide open. For sure, for sure. Um, if that was our last question, um, if the attendees have any more questions, uh, please feel free to use the use the chat here. But again, AC, Ade, Elise, we all want to thank you for you know taking the time. We know you guys are busy, uh, but taking the time to speak on a very important topic here and give some much needed much needed advice from the people who are within these industries, you know, definitely something we need to hear. Yes, if not for nothing, I learned something. So thank you guys. Thank you. We appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. So um, unfortunately, Devin is really sad that she's having internet problems. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to um, wrap it. I, um, I learned a lot. I really appreciate the